Hello, colleagues, and welcome to another episode of Dincast, where this one is going to absolutely blow your mind because I've got the absolutely wonderful Pam Warhurst on here, who is the co-founder of Incredible Edibles. Uh, welcome along, Pam. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the chat. Yeah, absolutely. For those of you who have not heard about Incredible Edibles, I promise you uh, this will be a really valuable 20 minutes finding out about this incredible social enterprise and all of the great work that it is is doing. But first of all, I want to sort of take us back in time, uh, probably about 13 years, I think it was, uh, Pam, to about 2008. And I was sort of reading that, you know, you ended up in a, a little cafe in Todd Morden. Um, and this was where the whole idea for Incredible Edible uh, actually sort of came about so come on what on earth came over you with your, your scone and your hot chocolate where you decided tell you what i want to establish this this social enterprise and tackle you know food poverty yeah well absolutely food poverty and everything else that goes with that you know um well well actually it started a little bit before that uh, uh a couple of weeks before that because um and i say this so i apologize if anybody's heard this because i've only got one story about the beginning because there was only one beginning which is uh, i was in london uh, and I was at a conference about the planet, basically, and where it was going. Um, and uh, particularly talking about food and food supply, Tim Lang. Um, and I've stuck with this faith that somewhere the leaders of this world are going to wake up to the issues around the planet and the poverty and the hunger and the wars and the other stuff that we get with climate change. And I've sat around sit waiting from Rio to Kyoto to Copenhagen and they haven't done a flipping sausage. So I left that conference and got on a train uh, to go back to Manchester uh, and I made up an incredible edible because I was just so cheesed off. I'm a mum and, you know, there is absolutely no point in sitting there whinging about what you can't do. You might as well crack on with what you can do. So I made up Incredible Edible, which was, OK, how do we motivate people to change the way they live their lives? What's the best means of doing that? Food. Food is the best means of doing that because we all engage with it in some way or another. Um, if we get food right, we get health right. If we get food right, we get economies right. If we get food right, we get community cohesion right. We get it all right if we get food right. And food in its own right is important enough as an issue for us to be talking about. So um, food was going to be the language I used. I call it the Trojan horse because it gets us into conversations about big issues that we sometimes scare people. But don't be scared. Because, you know, we need to just start changing the rules so that we can start to deal with some of those big issues. I invented a three plate solution, which was a, a part of a solution. It's an experiment. It's a little piece of a jigsaw. But how can we help people be positive, take action, take responsibility, take ownership? Well, three plates. One, plant food all over the place you call home, wherever you call home. Is it a street? Is it a town? Is it a village? Is it a state? Is it a city centre? It doesn't matter. Let's plant food as a community and let's just do it. Sometimes asking permission and sometimes not. Let's change the look of our places and create fabulous green spots in the middle of where we live, where people can see what food looks like when it's not in a plastic bag. Good idea, Pam. Next one is if we're going to create edible landscapes, we call them propaganda gardens, right? Because people have a chat around them. They have a chat, they have a poke, they have a pick, they have a suck, they have a remembrance of what their grandmas used to do or what they used to do in their homeland or whatever it was. That's what food is. That's what propaganda gardens are. Then we need to share that because folks have forgotten how to do that. So uh, instead of waiting for a flipping program that we have to pay money for in order to get a certificate, MBQ or whatever, find the aunties, the uncles, the whoever they might be who can you know, who can pickle, who can grow, who can cook, who can graft a tree. They're there in your community. Have a chat with them. That's the second one. Create your own network of arts. And the third bit is create jobs out of it. Spend your local money on local things and you will start to see that you get a sticky money economy. And if you get a sticky money economy, you get more local jobs. That's incredible edible. That's using food as a grassroots response to climate change. And it's, it's kind of worked over the past 13 years because you don't have to have a certificate to do it. You just do it. So that that's you know amazing in, in terms of sort of that that idea that it came from. But just a little bit about yourself and I mean, what, what, what was your background? You know, how 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 did you get into doing what I'm a Lancastrian who lives in Yorkshire. Uh, and they put up with me very well. 
Uh, I moved to this market town called Tomadon, which is where it all kicked off because that's happened to be the place I call home, 13,000 people. Before that, I was leader of a council, chaired a health trust, advised government on the environment, chaired the Forestry Commission of Great Britain, did a thousand and one other things. So I kind of know how systems work, but this is the most important thing I've ever done because this is roll up your sleeves, change the rules, make, it, make sure everybody has a chance to live well and prosper in a kind of prosperity. That's what Incredible Edible is trying to create from the grassroots, simply because me and my family and families I'll never meet and their families deserve a better deal than they've got now. And if somebody's not going to do it from on high, then we're going to do it from the grassroots. That's all. And so what were the skills that you were able to draw upon then to get this? You know, you've got this idea, you need to get some momentum. What were the skills that you drew upon to get it up and running? The main thing is you need to tell stories, you know. Um, but um, there's only four things you really need to kick off an incredible edible happening. You need somebody who's a bit savvy, a bit of a tactician, a bit of a strategist, can see which way the winds grow blowing and, and say, right, we're going to crack on here. You need a networker who knows where all the wood and the toy and, and the tools and, and the soil and whatever it is you're doing, who knows how to beg, borrow and steal that in their local community. You need someone who can hit the ground running, growing or cooking or whatever it is. And then you need a storyteller. That's all you need. You don't need anything else. And then because if you can, if you can demonstrate what change looks like, simply by rolling up your sleeves and planting something that nature is going to grow for you. And then you tell a story, but on social media or whatever else it might be. And then you create a little book that says this is how you do it and pass it to somebody else and they do it. Because none of this, none of this is done from the perspective of I'm an expert, shall I help you? <laughs> this is done, I'm a human being, are we going to do something about the way we live in this world? This is all it's about and it's kind of like that sense of we're not going to talk about it we're not going to worry that we haven't got a certificate we're not going to worry that the lottery hasn't given us any money we're not going to worry that somebody hasn't given us a lease or whatever we're just going to do it and and the beauty about that was we could hit the ground running a lot faster than if we'd done it through traditional measures and the reason we had to hit the ground running fast is because we had to demonstrate what alternatives look like you know, and we didn't want people meddling in halfway through it and writing a report and taking it to cabinet and doing anything like that. That you know, We need change fast. We need positive change fast. And we need to respect and trust our citizens that if we give them the support and the wind under their wings, they'll do this for themselves. And ultimately, we will build that kind of prosperity from a grassroots level. We will be able to think about how we reuse land how we stop people keeping off it and worry about mowing it when they could be growing food on it. You know, how we become servant leaders as anchor institutions, how we work better with our citizen, releasing their energy because we haven't got the money to buy in the energy that we used to buy in. <laughs> All this is coming to fruition because of climate change. All this, the, the urgency around this is because Food wars, water wars, increased poverty, increased isolation in communities. That is kind of like on the horizon. But we can do something in our communities around that, in our estates around that, in our townships, our boroughs, our streets or whatever. We can do something about that. And all we've done in 13 years is to point at it and say, this is what you can do if you want to start something. So I, I love that example, you know, actually, you know, you take people and you show them and they go, yeah. you know, I, I can see this for myself. But that 13 years won't have been an un, in uninterrupted sort of growth. You will have had barriers, you'll have had obstacles, you'll have had setbacks around that. So so what sort of things did knock Incredible Edible? And, and, and more importantly, how did you and the team manage to overcome them? Well, of course, there isn't a team. <laughs> so part of the story is... Um, Every single Incredible Edible group is a group of free-spirited people who adopt a model that's about giving of themselves to their community through food. That's fundamentally it. That's the model of Incredible Edible. Um, from time to time, we've had people that we've been able to find some funding for that have given support to those people, and it's worked better then. So one of the 
issues to deal with is how do you release resource without constraining your activity? That's a big question mark. And that is about building trust and having faith in new governance arrangements or having a repurposed public realm or whatever else it might be. But that is an issue. It's an issue that we've learned to recognise because when you start asking other people for funding, they have their own conditions. And their own conditions are usually limited by a range of metrics that aren't really increasingly relevant in this world. So if you're actually trying to change the rules in order that more people can be more engaged, grow more food, repurpose their public realm, you don't want to measure it with a kind of pendulums and pence metric that usually has been used in the past. And you don't want to measure success within a one-year framework because it needs to be a bit longer than that. On the whole, we haven't had a lot of setbacks, you know, because we just are volunteers in an experiment telling a story. And that isn't frightening. You see, people are frightened if we come with some expertise that's going to embarrass them. This is not, we're all in this together. So how together around a place do we create an alternative proposition? That's the story of Incredible Edible. And the beauty of it is, and I'm, and, and you know, I'm not... I'm not, I'm not minimising the hill that we've had to climb in the last 13 years. But there's nothing like the gun of climate change to your head to make you think, I'm still climbing this flipping hill, whether you've got a gun to it or not. So when we demonstrate, for example, when we took over some land at the front of uh, a disused health centre in the middle of Tottenham and built some raised beds there, this is right back in the beginning. 11, 12 years ago, uh, and put some signs up and all food was for free, all food was to share. This isn't about, you know, rose beds in the middle. This is about, we're growing herbs, we're growing this. If you want to share it, please share it. Don't take everything, you know, and if, if, if you take the last one, plant something if you can. This is trying to create that reciprocity. Well, we never asked the health people whether we could do that because we didn't ever got permission. But what was interesting is that eight months into it, we were contacted by the head of public health who said, I love what you're doing there. I wish you were doing it all over the place. Right? Interesting. People want to break out of a system. They don't know how to do it. Take what we did with the Calderdale, the council. We took over a dog toilet, right, very early days, which was unloved land, a grass verge. People threw stuff down there all the time. We cleaned it up. We planted herbs in there. Uh, we planted a few fruit, fruit bushes, all cheap and cheerful. This isn't about costing loads of money. Never ask the council. Why would we ask the council? They'd be inclined to say no. God bless them. And what happened within nine months of us doing that? The council said, would you like us to put a bench in there so that people can enjoy it? People want to change. This isn't that frightening a concept. We're only growing food, not building the Taj Mahal. So there's not been that many difficulties because the story gets right through to people's soul. They absolutely get why they can be part of something positive by simply tweaking the way they live their lives. That's all. So, so, so one question, I suppose, uh, and I don't know whether you have the answer to this, is, as I say, you've been going in for 13 years. You've clearly got a model which works, which gets people involved. Why, why does it prove so challenging then to sort of scale this across, you know, because you've got so many demonstration projects that you've proved the, the, the concept of. What, 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 what do you think the reasons for more people and more organisations not taking it up and scaling it? Well, it's, it, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm part of the Ashoka Fellow Network and they would, they would talk about scale in three ways. They would, scale, they would scale across, they would scale down and they would scale up. Scaling across is what I would call spreading. There's no problem with spreading. You tell a story. People are phoning up all the time. How do I start an incredible edible group? What can I do? You know, all over the world, Australia, France, Canada, you name it. We're writing a book about it at the moment. So spreading across, scaling across isn't a problem. Scaling down is a question of resource. How do you invest in your group so that they themselves can become more resilient? So that these wonderfully brave people can actually nurture more communities to do the same thing. That's scaling down. The bit you're talking about is scaling up, which yeah. is about how do you shift policies, actually, because that's that's the level of scale, because ultimately there's no problem with across and there's not a lot of problem with down if we can get the resource. With up, we challenge systems, and that's what people are uncomfortable about. 
because systems are what pay your mortgage. Systems are what means that you get up in the morning and you go somewhere and you know what you're doing and you know which desk you sat up and all the rest of it. Except we've had a pandemic which kind of disrupted that. So it kind of has allowed some people a little bit of time to say, I wonder if this is the best way to do it. I wonder if we're using the best, our assets to the best, uh, the best way that we can. That's kind of the conversation I'm having with health and the health estates about if, you, if you've got a health service that is predominantly thought of as an illness service and you're not actually establishing your health service in the heart of a healthy landscape, you're kind of missing a trick. So why don't you build your hospitals in edible grounds so that people can nurture and taste those plants? Not that it will feed them for the rest of their lives, but they might then take that skill set back home and they might stay out of hospital. And so you can extrapolate. So the reason it's difficult to scale up is that the intransigence around systems change. But if not now, then when? So now is the time to not be scared about systems change because all we're doing is shuffling around what we've already got and using it in a different way and thinking in a different way and sometimes that's the bit of a conversation that we need to open ourselves up to more you've talked a lot about community engagement and obviously with the social housing white paper and, and what happened with grenfell you know the whole residence voice piece is coming right to the fore particularly for my members in in the housing um sector i just wondered what uh, you thought was some of the lessons that we could take from the way that incredible edible does community engagement yeah well <laughs> yes of course uh, I, I guess what you talk would be one thing uh when if what we're talking about now is how do you how do you through people's home experience help people out of food poverty and help people see that they don't have to take a carrier bag somewhere that just maybe somebody's going to invest in them to grow their own or do their own or whatever i would say if you are talking about assisting people out of the cul-de-sacs they're in into you know avenues that they can walk that are more productive that you've got to walk the talk so i am not a community development person but for seven years i chaired the top and incredible edible group why because i couldn't from on high tell people that they needed to change the things that were coming from on high i had to learn the rules of the grassroots so you need to walk the talk first of all you need your messages very very simple and very doable which is why our strap line is believe in the power of small actions, because people will get it. Then you need to demonstrate what change looks like. You need to point at it. You need to be part of that change. You need to say, well, I've done it. What about you? So walk the talk, keep your messages simple and celebrate when you've got an achievement through the power of small actions. The, that for me is the really important thing. And there's some great examples in housing. You know, I'm a big fan of the Town and Country Planning Association. I'm a big fan of the Garden City movement. Not because everywhere could be, you know, Milton Keynes or whatever, but the principles and the values that underpin that can be, and still are in some cases, at the heart of how we provide homes for people. People need green space. They need to have that green space opened up for them to grow on. They need to have the tools to do that. They need to have the skills to do that. And most of the land is in and around many of your members' organisations. Wouldn't it be great if we just repurposed that green realm and just got people, not, not for a, oh, that's best practice, but for, oh, that's normal. That's what we do. That's why we signed up to be an incredible edible housing assaulting, because that's what we do. So, so for me, those are the three things that I would do. So one of the things that you really like to see within any sort of incredible edible project is a, a what you call a community kitchen. What, yeah. what, why, is, why is that important to have that? Because if we're going to help people out of um, the poverty and the ill health that they're in at the moment, um, and we're going to do that within planetary means, because... You know, we are not going to be flying, you know, half-baked chickens all over the planet or whatever else it might be. That is not going to be happening. If we're going to do that, how can we get people growing food on your estates if they don't know how to cook it? It doesn't make any sense. So the first port of call is bring people together to cook food. There's nothing 
more celebratory and engaging than being in a place where you are sharing and cooking food. That's the first stop. So you're, you're bringing communities together around food. It's a great asset. You're teaching people how to feed themselves. You're creating opportunities for people to share food and feed their streets. You're creating the opportunities to learn new skills and create social enterprises, which might well be part of your portfolio income, which might well help your family put more meals on the table. So community kitchens are a very recognisable human scale activity from which all sorts of benefits can ensue. So that's why I think community kitchens are incredibly important. And you've talked a lot about how uh, how easy, or sorry, how low cost it can be to just get on and sort of set set a, an incredible edible up. But what about the sort of the speed of something? If for, for a typical housing organisation who wanted to sort of get involved, you know, how long would it take from them having the initial conversation with yourself to actually having some, you know, some uh, stuff on the ground? Well, not very long. But, but there's a but there because all you do is to say to folks, this is not a boot camp. You know, and you cannot, it will not work if it comes from on high that they are creating an incredible edible. So what needs to happen is a housing association recognises that actually, you know, it's got some land, food could grow there, enterprises could start there, whatever it might be. So I would come in, say it was me, and I would ask the tenants at one of the tenant meetings respectfully, are you interested in this? This is what I've done. This is what they've done over here. This is what they've done over there. Now, if that interests you, let's do something about it. If it doesn't, that's fine. So the first thing is, have you got a bunch of people in an estate that's interested in starting this off? And if you have, then the wind under your sails comes from, well, actually, we're going to help people with the cost of seeds. We're going to help people with access to a tool store. We're going to help people. Stuff like that. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to make life so simple. We're going to take out a generic insurance policy so that everybody knows they can do it. We're not going to bother people with the details that we at the centre can get sorted. That's all it takes. Because then you'll find that there are people in that community who just hit the ground running, growing stuff, growing spuds, growing whatever. I mean, when I think about how it was done elsewhere, let me give you an example. There was a great group. It's, it wasn't a housing association. But there was a bunch of folks in Scotland who really wanted to draw people's attention to um, what food we could grow ourselves. So all they did was give everybody one of these jute bags, a bag of soil and some spuds. And the whole estate outside their front door grew spuds in jute bags because on the whole, they grow. And that encouraged people so that if we did that and then and then what they did was on a certain day, they all emptied their jute bags. They all took their spuds out. They all peeled their spuds and made chips and they had the biggest chip butter that you've ever seen. That is what happens. And once you've done that, which is inspiring people to say, do you know, we can do this. Once you've inspired, then you move on to inform. And inform then goes hand in hand with opportunity. And that's all you've done. So it would take less than a year to get that going, but you've got to work with the seasons. You know, you've got to work out who actually wants to do it. But I think, I think you inspire and then you grow next season and it would just happen. And sort of just coming to the end of the, our, our chat, Pam, I, I mean, obviously looking back and reflecting on, on the last sort of 13 years, is there anything you would have done differently um, in terms of, you know, growing or, or, or any of the decisions that you've taken with Incredible Edible? I don't think I'd have done it differently. I think because I'm not a great reader on uh, here are the theories of change that we ought to be. I'm, I, I just have a simple idea that seems to make sense to me as a mum. And it seems to have made sense to other people as mums as well. Um, I'd have probably been prepared better for some of the early adopters um, wanting to grow food but not understanding we were trying to change a system, I would have probably explained that, yes, this is about food and this is about self-worth, but it's also about living prosperously within limited means. I would have told that story slightly differently so I didn't forever have to be explaining I'm not an expert on cabbage growing. You know, I would probably have done that but ultimately, you know, I wouldn't have done anything different. And, and the only thing that I would ever say to anybody is 
because people are frightened of change, what you've got to do is make disruption joyous. You've just got to make it joyous. And then people get it and they're not frightened. And once they're not frightened, you can you can change history. Well, I think that's probably a most appropriate place to stop there, Pam. Make disruption joyous, colleagues. Um, you've heard that from the wonderful Pam Warhurst there. Um, and hopefully we can get to work together, Pam, and uh, spread some incredible edibles across you know, the country even more than what you have done now. So thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Loved it. Thank you.